crying to me, as I said before, like when I was at my own granny's funeral when I was a young kid, I remember standing there looking at her. We were awakened the, the body uh, up in the bedroom and everybody was crying uncontrollably like, and I was standing there and I remember looking around at people and going, what the hell is wrong with me? Like, you know, why can't I, like, I don't feel anything here. That's Jody Kennedy, and this, my friends, is the Yoga Life Podcast. What's up, Yoga Lifers? Can I say that now? Or do I, can I give this tribe of people that listen to this podcast the name an official name i think the yoga lifer sounds pretty good so we'll, we'll go with that we'll test test it out anyway hope you're keeping well hope you had a good week um in ireland now it's it's pretty cold so i hope you're keeping warm and not getting fluey uh, if you listen in australia i hope you're not getting sunburnt you know just basically look after yourself no matter what the weather elements are this week i have with me jody kennedy he is it's hard to explain jody or describe Jody, describe Jody, should I say, because he's a man of many talents. He is passionate about ancestral health and fitness, but how I know him is through going on his rewilding of man retreat. If you follow me on Instagram, you would have seen that about four months ago, five months ago, I went to meet a bunch of men uh, on a hillside crack of dawn to carry rocks to run up hills to wrestle to be submerged in cold water to beat our chest to um chant and get rewilded so jody was the guy who organized that that's his idea and um, since then last month just before christmas we did a uh, winter solstice where i brought my girlfriend it was a mixed group men and women and um, had the shock of my life when um, we jumped into the Irish Sea, Irish Sea, Irish Sea in December, and um, yeah, that's that's an a, an event I won't forget. But Jody's um, real interesting. He was in the military before. He's went to Peru, had an amazing ayahuasca experience, and um, I think I love his story. He's got a great voice as well. I said to him, Jody, man, you got to start a podcast with that voice. He's got a real gravitas in his voice and uh, he also he's also got a very uh, authentic Dublin accent so if you want to know what a Dubliner sounds like Jody's your man so without further ado here's Jody what's up Jody what's happening brother how are you I'm good mate how are you very good very good welcome welcome to the pod what do you think it's it's fabulous it's a wonderful <laughs> setup uh, this thing in my face is quite intimidating <laughs> that's the microphone you're referring to <laughs> <laughs> i hope so <laughs> um so uh we were just talking about before we hit record authenticity and yes. i think i think like that is why podcasting is becoming so popular is people want to hear uh, an authentic message um what would you, you know, I was chatting to my girlfriend yesterday, I said, oh, Jodie Kennedy, because she, she just met you on the, our latest excursion. Mm -hmm. I said, Jodie is coming to the, on the podcast on Monday. She goes, what does he do for a living? I said, he is a, <laughs> so I said, you're a personal trainer. Is that fair? Yeah, so I do, yeah, I've got multiple facets going on. Yeah, this is always like, so I do, <laughs> yeah, I do train people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I obviously deal with a man, um, focused stuff that, that we've done so day mm. day retreats and and hopefully moving into longer more immersive stuff um and i do a lot of corporate work on on the other side of that so corporate mm. seminars and, and um all that type of thing talks and seminars and training as well you know mm. going into big corporates and doing that type of stuff so that's i can't talk about that stuff as much because it's all non-disclosure you're not allowed to really talk about it too much so mm. That's something I don't like get to put out there that much, but uh, yeah, I do quite a lot of that stuff actually. Mm. So, but I think it's interesting you, you say multifaceted or multidisciplined, because I think that is the way the world is going now. There mm. isn't just one job you do. I think it's important to have many skills and be be able to 
diversify like the days of having one job for life is over yeah and i think if you can't especially in your line of work if you can't um if you don't learn how to market yourself how to do other things um then you're you're really limiting it yourself um but the, the what i what the reason why i wanted to chat to you is i listened to your podcast with a lost man standing and um i i really do feel like men's mental health is a men's actually men's health yeah. in general is is sometimes overlooked especially in the world of yoga a lot mm -hmm. of people listen to this are yoga teachers or yoga practitioners and g give them an idea okay so i went on your your uh, rewilding of man before christmas and i have to say it was one of the most demanding things i've ever done it really was <laughs> it put it it was but i wouldn't shut up about it for about a month afterwards every person i met i was just like <laughs> bending their ear about it what would you what, what is it for the for the someone who hasn't done it so the rewilding of man i suppose like how that came about is is when I originally I got into fitness and and was training and like the further you get into something, the more you realize how big it is. If that makes sense. So like if if you're on the right path as you progress in something, it should start to get bigger rather than get smaller. So you, like you should start to see how you're never gonna achieve mastery of something. And with fitness, it was kind of as I got into it, I started to realize that. It, <laughs> Like if I want people to stick to a program or stick to a diet or whatever the, the long-term goal may be, the real focus is on like mental discipline and on even like the spiritual aspect of being able to, to stick to something, you know what I mean? Of having the resolve to see something through. And I start to see that you can't separate mental physical and the the spiritual side they they are all the one thing you know um so if you want to if you want to stick to a program or if you want to become functional and fit like you've got to look at all aspects of it mm. or it's not something that you're going to maintain into the long term so that was initially kind of how i started to think a little bit differently and that came from i suppose martial arts originally um when i was younger and then looking at fitness through that lens as well. And the rewilding of man thing was like after I went to, after I went off to Peru, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit, um, and had a little bit of a, an awakening, I suppose, about myself and about my inability to, to do certain things as a man and how society and how we are just conditioned to, to stuff emotion down and, and on the one side and then on the other side, in modern society, it's very uncool in a lot of ways to be masculine, you know? Mm. Um, and I have both sides of that because I grew up in a single mother household, you know? My mother brought the two of us up, two boys, two little lunatics. And, and so I have that, like, softer side, you know? I spent a lot of time around females and... Obviously, my mother was a, a big, uh, a big figure at growing up, you know. But at the same time, I always sought that masculine side of things, and I think that was why, like, I went into martial arts, and that was why I, I went to the army. Was I was looking for these masculine role models, maybe to a certain extent, and, and like, yeah, I was searching for something that I could imitate to to a certain degree, you know. Mm. Um, and I didn't necessarily find it in those places, you know, mm. uh, without sounding too foo-foo, where, where I found that was in myself when I when I went away and I actually took a deep look inside of myself mm. and realized that, you know, masculinity is part of, of what we are. You can't remove masculinity from men, just like you can't remove femininity from women. Um, and I don't see a lot of outlets for that now. And I think this maybe is a big part of why we have so much trouble with, with mental health with men, mm. you know, and coupled with the, with the fact that people, there's a certain point of view of like, you know, suck it up 
and get on with it. It's, it's very hard for men to talk about this stuff and, and kind of open up even to their closest friends. Mm-hmm. So the rewilding of man was like a, a amalgamation of a, a lot of different angles. And like the man side of it is just, that's where I feel semi-qualified to, to like with, with women, I don't feel like I haven't gone through that experience as a woman. So I don't feel like I can talk as confidently or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, as clearly about that. But from the male side of things, like I've been that guy who was unable to, you know, cry at my own granny's funeral. I'm wondering what was wrong with me. I've been the guy who's, you know, had trouble supporting friends when they were going through emotional times. Um, and I've come through that and kind of, I would hope that I have evolved in that regard. Mm. Uh, um, so I feel that I can maybe help guys to, to see that side of things a little bit more mm-hmm. and that, you know, expressing emotion doesn't necessarily make you weak. It makes you stronger mm-hmm. in the long run, you know? And it's one of the hardest things to face down is your own shit, yeah. essentially, you know? So... Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Does it? <laughs> and absolutely, the the because my experience of that event was carrying the sandbags, running, with, wrestling, the, the cold water immersion. It was stuff that so the the physical stuff just test made me feel good because I I like that physical exertion. I'm not the most masculine guy, um, like archetypal mask masculine guy, but my dad is a a carpenter i mean he built this loft uh, like from he did everything in this loft um and when i was younger my how i bonded with my dad because was so was so um we couldn't be more different so how i bonded with him was to help on the building site and his dad was a farmer his dad was a farmer farmers farmer so they're all physical lifting carrying stuff so when i used to be when i was younger and i'd help my dad on the building site if i got a splinter in my finger or a callus, I'd be like, really proud of it. Yes, you know, I'm, a, I'm like my dad, yeah. you know, and uh, and that, so when I'm lifting things and doing things that I don't get a chance to do in everyday life, it makes it gives me that connection to, I don't know what, but it makes me feel like uh, I'm, oh man, this sounds like almost like as good as my dad or mm. something like that. Because I, I was, and also, so you have the physical side in your, in your, um, in your reward of man, you also have the the bonding side, like we were slapping each other on the back and doing chanting and breathing. And because it was in that in that setting, if it was in a yoga class, I think a lot of guys would be uncomfortable with it. Mm. Because it was in that setting, it felt was way more comfortable doing it. And then um, you have the um, emotional side, like the way a lot of the <laughs> when I went there, I think it was Mark. He was like. What's up, brother? And I was, I was like, uh, oh, hello, brother. You know, everyone <laughs> calling each other brother. And I was like, this is pretty cool. You know, I, I actually like that. I'm just not used to it. Because um, I was saying to my girlfriend, mate, it was like two days ago, I was saying how I have aggression inside me that I need to get it out. And that made me sound like a complete psycho. But I think a lot of men or people do. And I need that outlet. That's why I used to love jiu-jitsu. Mm. Um, and... When I do let that aggression out, or maybe aggression is the wrong word. No, I don't. Or energy. I don't think so. You don't think so? No. But it's a dirty word now. I don't think we need to be ashamed of it. Like aggression is, is something everybody has to deal with. You know. I think because we associate, or I do, I associate the word aggression with violence, mm. and they're not the same. Uh, but I think. Do you think that's a, um, a, a quite a common association people would make? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's like aggression, dominance, you know, those things are, are things that we think of as, as negative things. Mm. But if there's a burglar coming through the door, aggression is is a great emotion to have at mm-hmm. that point. Or if you've got to push through something that, that is hard to push through, you know? Well, I mean, even the progress of humanity it requires when you're doing a task that you don't want to do, whether it, whether it be redesigning your website or mm-hmm. inventing the wheel, <laughs> it, it, a bit of aggression helps you to keep going when you when you don't want to. Um, 
What so going back to you, you referenced Peru, before you went to Peru, you were in the you were in the Irish Army. Is that right? Yeah. Or is it the British Army? No, it's the Irish Army. Okay, yeah. sorry. Help, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so t- talk to me about how you got into that. Well, ever since I was a young boy, I was obsessed with weapons, <laughs> and I was obsessed with with um, military things soldiering tactics all of that stuff as a, as a kid like my, when I I think it was a couple of years ago my mom said to me I think it was at Christmas time we were sitting down chatting you know and we were, we were talking about old stuff and she said uh, me and your father we were really happy when you got into the army when you joined the army because we knew that you were going to get your hands on guns one way or another <laughs> and I said I was like oh I'll take that as a compliment but <laughs> I think you know what she meant was that I had a certain amount of aggression and I had a, like I needed an outlet for that side of myself you know and while other people were filling in the CEO forms and, and <laughs> going to college I knew exactly what I wanted to do um, and I had no interest in going to college at that stage and I went straight into the army and you know the army served as a, it served as a good rite of passage for me as a young man because I was probably a little bit wild, um, and I probably was a little bit disrespectful of authority, and I didn't like being told what to do. And the army kind of taught me to just shut up and do what I was told, um, mm. which was not a bad thing, you know. And it served as a, a rite of passage in in regards to like. It gave me a real self confidence in my own ability to to push through and stick things out when when the going's bad, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think I did go in as a boy and I came out as a man. Like that's really the way I felt. I think that's missing for a lot of people now, for like men especially, like this rite of passage or or some kind of test because you learn a lot about yourself when you go through these things mm-hmm. you know and it gives you confidence like even on our, our day you said it was one of the one of the most physically demanding things you've done yeah well you probably learned something about yourself mm-hmm. you know is that you're in when you're in moments of, of high stress and you don't know if you can you know you're questioning yourself and that that self-doubt starts to creep in and it's a real skill it's a muscle to learn how to control that you know, and, mm-hmm. and keep driving on. Definitely. And when you do it, it gives you a real sense of accomplishment afterwards, you know. Mate, I was elated. I mean, I um, I said to my girlfriend, I was like, it's funny how when me and her go for a run, I get tired after about 15, 20 minutes. I, I'm not used to running that much anymore. But it's amazing how your mind can be so powerful if it, when, it, when it needs to be. And just that alone is enough of a takeaway from a, an event like that. Um, so how long were you, were you in the army for? I was 12 years in there. Wow. Yeah, probably a little bit too long, to be honest. Um, because as a young man, like the first five years, I really enjoyed, very physical, especially the first like year or two when you're going through that boot camp phase and it's just like really physically demanding. And I really enjoyed that, actually. <laughs> that was my favourite part. Um, but after you come out of that phase, then you go to barrack life and barrack life is a little bit, boring to be honest with you so like Mm. there's no soldiering going on you're essentially just they're trying to find jobs for you to do and you end up going on courses and applying for courses just to get out of that like barrack life you know so it tends to get a little bit monotonous after that you know Mm. so I I, after five years I probably should have left but I went to college and when they pay they pay for your college they pay you while you're in college I should say so you owe them time then back so i did four years and i owed them four years back okay um and that's the way it goes when you when you owe the army there's no getting out you know Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you went to peru after that i went to peru just before i left the army so it was like i was due to leave in i think it was may and i went to peru in february Mm. Uh, Why Peru? Well, Peru is the home of ayahuasca, which is <laughs> the, the whole reason that I went. I thought, to that, I thought yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to assume. Uh, and you, you were in Peru for three years. 
No, 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 oh, no, so no, 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 no. I, I was in Peru for a month. <laughs> I wasn't in Peru for three years. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay, you're in Peru for a month. So I went, I went to Peru to a center for for five weeks mm. to to uh, a guy called Don Howard Lawler, who was a, an ayahuasquero. He's originally trained as a Native American shaman down in. New Mexico somewhere I think and and worked his way through South America um and sampled the medicines you know he's like a peyote shaman uh, he's an ayahuasquero he's a Wachuma shaman which is the San Pedro cactus um and he runs an amazing center down in in Iquitos in Peru it's right in the Amazon basin mm. um and I'd say thousands of people have probably been through this center and I heard about that through a couple of different people and I wanted to go to a place that was respected and because there's a lot of messing going on now with with this ayahuasca kind of tourism so you just need to be very careful about where you go so I did I did a lot of research and picked the right place mm. um, and I headed down there for five weeks tell us about it then what was ayahuasca like <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a very interesting process how, how does it actually work like what do you drink tea or how's it go yeah so you make you make the brew it's made from two essentially main parts one is a vine which contains an mao inhibitor so you have monoamine oxidase which is an enzyme in your stomach that breaks down the active component, which is DMT, dimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine, which is what gives you the psychedelic experience. But we have a natural inhibitor in our stomach that, that kills this. So grass, leaves, thousands of plants are loaded with DMT, but we can't access it because our stomach acid breaks it down. Hmm. Yeah. So the actual vine is the MAO inhibitor. So it's the thing that stops our our stomach acid breaking DMT down. So you mix these two in a brew and they boil it up for 24 to 48 hours and then you drink it and it tastes like ass. It's horrible. Like It's <laughs> really, really bad. Like um, when you drink a sizable cup of it as well, it force it down. Mm. But um, it's all very ritualized and ceremonial which I think is a big part of why it's so effective, you know, mm. in, in helping people. But the experience itself is, is varying depending on the person. So for me personally, the experience was quite introverted. A lot of people have very, very visual experiences and they go on, on, you know, wild journeys through different dimensions and all kind of things happen. But for me, it was very introverted process. It was more somatic. It was more feeling and mind than actual visual, if that makes sense. Mm. It's hard to explain. It was more mind. Than... Well, it was more like a feeling than, okay. than okay, yeah. a yeah. visual process, mm -hmm. you know. And there was a lot of visuals, like there was a lot of visual aspects to it but mm -hmm. um it takes maybe an hour to an hour and a half for the the medicine to start working and then you start purging which is a fancy word for puking and crapping oh yes yeah well not always both um not always one or the other either it depends on the person again uh, but the purge is yeah an interesting part of it like so the I think the purge, like part of it, really like brings it on. So when you start to purge, it it, it starts to get much more intense. You know what I mean? And, and you start to hear people popping around you, like so. That it kind of you drink the medicine. You're sitting in. It's all done in like old. It's, they call them malocas, like they're circular huts with grass roofs in them. Kind of you're sitting there in the dark with the altar is lit and it's very ceremonial they're chanting they've got specific songs that they sing to like 
communicate with the plants and bring this stuff on and they kind of control the space very well but you start to hear people going one by one you know and you know it's coming for you soon you know what I mean (laughs) (laughs) so initially I I was very I feel like I wasn't like quite open so the first ceremony I drank and I didn't really get anything so I don't think I was quite like in the right place and then for the second ceremony, I remember asking Don Howard, I said, I, I, like, I, I'd like to have some more if it's possible. So I remember him filling up like a double the amount that I'd had on the first one. Mm. And uh, I choked that down. And in that ex- that ceremony, I went way too far. So it was too much. It was like I just, yeah, it was just too much of a shock to my body. And I was puking and purging and and i remember there's guys outside they take care of you like um helpers you know and you call banyo which means toilet basically <laughs> if you need help and they come in and take you outside and uh what, had they had to carry you because you're so they like, messed basically up. had to carry me yeah. i was walking and then i would just like it's hard to explain like this <clears throat> the fract the, the images and the the visions that you have are very fractal kind of aztec style uh, visuals it's, it's very hard to explain mm. it's like it's like reality fragments into just multiple thousands of like kaleidoscopic type images wow that's yeah, that cool it's crazy <laughs> but like i'm trying to walk out and these guys are trying to help me and i'm just like this just comes down across your eyes like a tapestry like <laughs> And you just like I dropped into it, and then I would wake up and I'd be like doubled over, like on the floor, and they'd be trying to help me up, and then I'd try to walk again, and it would just it would hit me again, you know. And it was really intense. And like after that ceremony, I was kind of scared then to go back in. I was like, oh shit, what the fuck have I got myself into here? Like it's this is hardcore. And I remember I rang home. I rang. Aoife, my wife, and I was like, uh, I don't, f- there's nothing kind of happening, you know what I mean? I don't feel like I'm not getting, because I had expectations in my head of what to expect, you know, and it was all very like, I'm going to go here and drink and then everything's going to be hummingbirds and butterflies and <laughs> I'm going to get the answers that I need, you know, but um, unfortunately things don't work that way. So I remember ringing Aoife and I was kind of like frustrated a little bit and I was saying, I, I don't feel like, anything's happening I don't know if this is for me and we were chatting um, and then I just like broke down in tears like and just from nowhere like I just and I cried like <sighs> Jesus I cried for hours that day like just uncontrollably after being on the phone and um, I was like alright maybe there is something going on here maybe there is something at work here because like crying to me as I said before like when I was at my own granny's funeral when i was a young kid i remember standing there looking at her we were awakened the the body uh up in the bedroom and everybody was crying uncontrollably like and i was standing there and i remember looking around at people and going what the hell is wrong with me like you know why can't i i don't feel anything here and i remember my cousin saying to me like you how come you're not you didn't cry yet at the funeral and I kind of felt real weird about it you know I was kind of like I don't know this were you like, close to her? yeah very close to her yeah yeah it's just uh, somebody put it very well and they called it emotional constipation <laughs> okay so it's not like that you don't want to feel the feelings it's like you've conditioned yourself to to shy away from that you know mm. so as if you if you perceive emotion as weakness when it comes at you you're going to you're going to put up your defenses and that's exactly the way it felt so to me expressing emotion was weakness mm-hmm. so i just shut it down and i think a lot of men do this is mm-hmm. they just like the walls go up and they don't want to experience the feeling of the emotion mm-hmm. and they just shut it away but then it becomes impossible to access that then when you, if you ever need to access it, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's not there, and that can be very frustrating. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time to kind of open that back up again. So that was like, I, I hadn't 
cried really in a long time. And that day I cried for hours. And I remember thinking, okay, maybe there is something going on here, you mm. know. Um, and the ceremonies after that were were much more um, introspective and kind of I got a, I got a lot from the from the other ceremonies that I did after that, you know. Mm. But those first two were kind of a real jar and like nothing, and then too much, and then I kind of recalibrated after that a little bit, I think, and and kind of got a lot more from it, you know. Mm. So um, you, you know what's funny is that it's I wonder I think ayahuasca sounds to me like it definitely works it does because the reason why it's so popular but I wonder how much of it is a placebo effect obviously the the this, like if you were just to drink it on its own and uh, have no ceremony I wonder how effective it would be the fact that they make it you know there's an altar almost and there is a whole ritual behind it and then you, you feel like there is a process going on here and it's a little bit like um, I feel like alcohol does that for men on a much smaller scale but more accessible scale that they can have a beer and speak how they actually want to speak and often it's it's in a guise through sport you know they'll ex express their inter their dissatisfaction with their football team or whatever but they're really talking about their life you know and um, I, I, I want to actually share something with you um, and it's very topical because I just came back from the park I was uh, using this ca new calisthenics rigs they've put in the local park and there's a guy there hopefully he might be listening to this podcast hopefully not <laughs> but it is because this is quite awkward um he i mm, maybe like four months ago in the summer five months ago i was exercising out in the park and this guy comes over and he's like hey how are you I was like, what uh, I'm fine, yeah. And I was had my headphones on. I was working out. I had kind of brought like some like hip hop music on. I was feeling a bit aggressive. I didn't really want to speak to anyone. When people disturb me in the park, I actually don't like to speak to them because I'm I'm in a kind of aggressive mood. Oh, yeah. And I just like to get my my thing done. And I, anyway, so he he says, "How are you? Um, oh, can I um, use your rings as well? They were the the Olympic rings." And I I, I reluctantly allowed him to use the rings, and. It, as my adrenaline was kind of wearing off, I realized that he just wanted to speak to me. He just wanted to like speak to another man in the park. And he was, the fact that he was foreign made it a bit more um, understandable. If he was another English Irish guy, I think it was a bit odd. But um, he, it was like he was a 10 year old boy speaking to another 10 year old boy or a five year old boy like, oh, can I play with your toys? So because he was an adult man, I was thinking he's either wants to mug me or date me I don't, <laughs> like you know he fancies me or something um you know i i, I was so the fact that he could just want to speak to me as an around was unusual so i'm ashamed to say this i actually lied to him i said um he said he said do you live around here i says no i don't live here i live in england just because I, <laughs> I was so freaked out i said i'm just here for the weekend and i thought i'd use these come down to the park and um, and then um, he he was really really lovely guy. He says, "Oh, maybe we'll work out again together or something." And I said, "Oh, well, I don't live here, so see you later." And normally I'm not like that, but just because that situation. And then today, <laughs> five months later, I'm in the park and I bump into him. <laughs> I know, and he's using, and he's he's there, and he says, um, "Oh, I thought you you lived in England." I said, "Oh, I live here now." and Actually, I've I, I been living here all the time. You know, I am English and just, I didn't go into details as to why I lied. But um, <laughs> yeah, th this guy, he's such a lovely guy. And I had time to think about that encounter five months ago. And real, and I said it to my girlfriend and she said, was he like Polish? I, said, I think he was actually. She said, yeah, they tend to be really friendly. Mm. Like, because, um, and I think they, they serve in the military as well. They have compulsory military and that, means they're more open to chatting to other men and get and i thought man shame on me you know f that mm. i was so closed minded to um his intentions and um yes yeah, so i took his phone number today <laughs> i was like yeah I, I, I would text you next time i'm down the park but um <laughs> set up a mandate oh uh, set up a mandate yeah, <laughs> yeah would, would, would you make it up I think maybe a lot of that is cultural, you know, and like Irish and English people are much less open to um, interacting with strangers, for mm. sure. 
like than other nationalities. Like uh, you look at Italian people and French people. Even even look at like outdoor training culture in other countries. Irish people, you like it's getting more popular now, but it's very rare you'd catch someone like out at an outdoor rig like that doing a workout because they feel like other people are looking at them more. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real cultural thing with Irish and English people. And we're getting out of that. Like we're, we're, we're growing out of that. And that obviously comes probably from Catholic church or, or, you know, British oppression or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but, but there's definitely has been that thing there and probably interacting with strangers is a part of that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he was a guy, you know, you're like, why is this guy doing something out of the ordinary approaching me? It's natural to think, you know, in a defensive manner, <laughs> kind of. But it's unfortunate that we do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it really is, yeah. Like, I don't think you need to you need to be ashamed of, of <laughs> doing what you did. If, if for any reason that, like, I always say, listen to your instincts. So if, you, if you're... If you're doing something, if you feel weird about a situation, you know, go with your gut on it. Mm. Because who knows, maybe he does want to chop you up and put put you in his freezer. <laughs> <laughs> put your head on his mantelpiece. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it did make me think that, like, um, you know, I, I need to be a bit more, um, just give people the benefit of the doubt. In, in that yeah. But it is because he was a big... Mm -hmm. um, guy and if it was a woman i wouldn't feel a physical threat unless she was like a professional fighter or something oh you'd, you'd be chuffed with yourself if that was a woman <laughs> you'd, be, <laughs> you'd be having the time of your life yeah, i know yeah so um but yeah it just goes to show you that like men uh, we still have a lot to 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 learn especially irish english men and i think you're right i think it is a mixture of repression by the catholic church and reliance on alcohol Mm -hmm. I, I actually do Northern European men. I think that's why it's, it's, it's so popular. Because um, when I was in, I was in lived in Korea for a couple of years, and you'd see businessmen walking down the street with their briefcase in one hand, fifty or businessmen holding hands. You, you, you go to you go to the Middle East or Morocco specifically, men, straight men holding hands walking Crazy. down the street, um, and just no big deal. And it's. It's actually quite cute to see, like you know, two Korean businessmen holding hands. They're all like <laughs> they're kind of pink, red faces, and drinking loads of um, soju, and they're they're, all, they're chuffed to bits. And I, I, I think, um, and even when I was in Paris, man, like you know, the guys meet, they they do th four kisses on the cheek and stuff. Yeah. It's um, it, yeah, it, it is part of it is definitely a culture thing. But um, I, I I plan to th this year to do a lot more like yoga for men events. I think mm. that's um. What's your, what's your um, well, maybe not your take on yoga. Well, yeah, I suppose. But what's your, what's your experience with yoga? And that's a quite a broad word, yeah. yoga. I, I love yoga. Like I started, I originally started doing yoga because I wanted to get into meditation and I couldn't sit still <laughs> mm. and do nothing. And, and I found <laughs> like just sitting down and meditating very difficult. Um, so I started doing yoga as a kind of form of, moving meditation because i always remembered when i when i trained traditional martial arts when i was younger we did a lot of forms and kata style things with breath control which is essentially moving meditation you know and i remember connecting really well with those moving forms and they gave me a, a real like there was something in it for me like that that made me feel better you know mm -hmm. So I think that's why I gravitated towards yoga then as, as like breathing, moving, meditation. And that's, I started going to classes in Samadhi originally, actually, which is where you were teaching now. So I used to go to lunchtime classes in Samadhi. Mm. And then I branched out and I just started trying loads of different styles. And like, I'm no, I'm no yogi by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I just like moving and, I love to experience different things. So yeah, I've tried like the la last year I went hard at Bikram in, in Dublin city Bikram yoga. Mm -hmm. I'd had no experience with Bikram before that. And I just went at it and I actually really enjoyed it. And I've tried all, I've tried all, all styles, I think probably at some stage. Um, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing practice. Mm. Uh, in terms of even just bodily function, 
like some of the biggest gains I've noticed in in flexibility and, and feeling good about certain joints in my body were through yoga for sure mm. rather than stretching and you know like mm-hmm. inverted commas mobility practice um I think it's a powerful thing just to dedicate a certain amount of time per week to moving for the sake of opening your body up mm. and you know yeah and i think that a lot of men have a misconception about yoga that it's just i mean, i've heard people say this other men say this flat out that oh yoga is just lying around and stretching your legs mm. or you know or just a <laughs> it's not is you just breathe and think of nothing but actually particularly bikram it's um it's joe i mean joe rogan does bikram yoga and yeah. he he once said that yoga is like a martial art against yourself mm. and i love that because when i do yoga sometimes i feel really aggressive man mm. like i feel um like i'm trying to stick a handstand or i'm trying to i'm on one leg trying to do transition and it's me almost against my body but yet my body's helping me and it's just it, it's such a great physical outlet um that where you experience a spectrum of emotions not just peace and love and actually when you get to that shavasana at the end that meditation that blissful part when you've gone through the turmoil of the aggressive more aggressive poses it's so much more enjoyable Mm. it's so much more more an experience um what's your so what's your meditation practice now then so again varied like (laughs) i'm greedy with all things and I, i like to try all things so i think like aiming to be a generalist in in as many things as possible is a good way to to go Mm -hmm. you get a varied kind of view of everything so yeah i've I've tried lots of different types of meditation like mindfulness and you know visualization and all the all of these different styles and i find that breath work is probably the one that i connect with the most personally Mm -hmm. you know um and I tend to go towards like more, not aggressive styles of breath work, but towards things that pull me in a little bit more. When when I'm more involved in it, it it's it it holds me in for longer, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, I'll get quite into like deep breath work. Mm. Uh, is that through cold water immersion or do you can do you do I do them separately, separately, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's actually very rare that I would do cold water and breath work in the same session, you know. I tend to if I'm if I'm doing cold water stuff, I tend to do it while I'm trail running or something like that. Mm. Breath work I do in the morning, you know, as part of my routine in the morning when I get up and mm. it's a nice time to do it, I think, is to move your joints a little bit do some breath work and get some oxygen flowing around the body, mm-hmm. get your brain centered, get your mind focused and then go, go forward into your day. You know, I think that's a nice time to do it. Yeah. And maybe before bed is good too, but I tend to do it in the morning. I tend to front load my day a lot like that where I'll just like get a lot of stuff done early mm-hmm. and then kind of end up going to bed early. But you know, the, the latter half of the day won't be as, as jammed. But mm. the breathwork stuff, I'm going more towards the kind of vacuum breathing. I do a fair bit of Wim Hof style. Just I, I like the freedom of, of that stuff where it's like, it's not really dogmatic. There's no strict rule set with it. It's just like get as much oxygen in as you can, you know, mm. and, and then do a hold at the end. And it's really simple. I think the simpler it is, the more you're going to do it, the Definitely. more approachable it is for most people. And, you know, just remove all of that, like, fluff that people tend to put into things to make them seem more complicated than they are. I, th- I think, as well, people do that maybe because they're trying to sell oh, meditation packages. And the problem is that um, it puts people off because mm-hmm. they think, oh, well, I can't continue this on my own because there's so many ways to meditate. I mean, I don't... Uh, meditate uh, as in i don't do guided meditations or anything like that I, I do teach meditation in my class but my meditation would be five minutes at the end of yoga practice me and my girlfriend sit back to back and we breathe together i said i can feel her breathing she nice. can feel me breathing and um we do a bit, of ch- a bit of chanting as well and that's that's uh that's good for me because uh, like you i find it hard to uh, if it's too complicated it, it, it's hard to make a habit mm. um in fact actually you know, we I, we still 
speaking of cold water immersion, like we still, me and my girlfriend still laugh and talk about when we did that um, excursion with yourself and Naomi yeah. um, and how I was jumping into the sea like and it's great because your brother Danny like recorded a video of it which is like one of my favourite videos of us jumping into the sea <laughs> I gotta say man that was like because um, yeah that was like <laughs> I, I would never forget that experience and I, I really hope you do one of those events again because it That's was awesome. it was amazing I think you should you guys my advice would be do more of them because mm. they'll do really well. I know we are de definitely going to do more. That was like a we were feeling out the 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 ground, you know, with that one, and just yeah. wanted to see how we could run, how we could do it, um, mm. and like I've been meaning to to do something that's mixed anyway because like I I have a focus on men. Like I feel like that's a direction that. I want to go, but I also don't want to be just like the man guy, you know? Mm. So like there's, there's something in this for everybody. Like, it, like it's not just men that can benefit from this. I think we're all in the same boat now in terms of, you know, our lack of nature contact, um, yeah. our physical situation that we're all in being sedentary so much of the time. A lack, a lack of uh, camaraderie and tribe and connecting with people who are on the same level of us. And there's so many aspects to it that are, you know, for everybody, male or female. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, in from my own particular experiences, I feel like I can push towards men a bit more, but, like, I enjoy doing it with a mixed group just as much and that's why like me and Naomi connected because it was I was kind of looking for somebody a female figure that could be a part of it you know because I wouldn't feel people had said to me you should do a, a, a female one just girls um, and I was mm. like how would that work with just me you know and a group of girls like it would be different you know mm. I wouldn't be able to create the experience with the same like accuracy or, or mm. whatever that, that I could with men, you know, mm. so I wouldn't feel as qualified really. Yeah. So to have some kind of strong female figure there that, that can, you know, stand for that side of it. And mm. I think the mixed event was great. It went it really brilliant, well, man. you know. Because it brought us, me and my girlfriend closer together because I was, I'd re re reference you or um, that group and, and then when she actually got to meet you guys and, and as you said, Male, female, whatever gender you want to um, attach to yourself, there's so, it's so hard to find an excuse to go outside these days, mm. especially when it's cold. And just to get people outside is, I think, probably the most beneficial thing. Um, so in terms of, because it's 2019 now, mm -hmm. have you got any, um, what's, what's the next thing on you, uh, the next thing on the horizon for you, events-wise? Events-wise, yes, yeah, so I'm going to do another rewilding of man event on uh, in march okay on the equinox and then we're looking at a summer event for a mixed group and there will be uh, i'm planning to run maybe a, a, an overnight or a two day in the summer for for men and really dig deep into like get, get a little bit deeper into it mm. you know with some long breathwork sessions mm -hmm. and some real physical adversity if you want to put it that way and the focus on on the group and our individual parts in in each group and how we can all be a part of the group no matter what mm -hmm. our physical attributes or our mental attributes you know finding your own strengths within the group mm -hmm. and being an essential part of the group mm -hmm. which is a huge um huge self-value thing is like finding your place what do you offer to people um and what are your strengths and actually knowing that is, is a huge thing mm -hmm. get some drum drumming involved uh, mm -hmm. late night drumming session cook some meat over a fire and just get primal with it you know and, and get, <laughs> get deep primal get primal with it. with it yeah get deep into that <laughs> stuff because look uh, like we all have this inside of us like so when like when you went on that day on the on the rewild of man day you know there's like there's something in that whole process that feels natural to us all. It's like we're exerting ourselves physically. We're in a small group of men. Like this stuff has been going on for millions of years where men have got together in groups and set out in the in the 
low light of dawn for whatever <laughs> reason it may be hunting parties and war parties and all of that stuff and I think that that's something that connects deeply with us mm. you know and there's something inside of us that that recognizes that and um, and there can be a catalyst for self-reflection and change in that yeah if that makes sense yeah absolutely man yeah. so if people want to contact you what's the best place to reach you probably through email jodykennedy.ie at gmail.com and my website is jodykennedy.ie and instagram jodykennedy.ie as well yeah and you can contact contact me through any of those channels for sure and that's j-o-d-y everyone yes correct (laughs) (laughs) cool man that's it all right ledge done good stuff and there you go folks or should i say yoga lifers do you reckon i'll take off we'll see that's Mr. Jody Kennedy. Next week, I have with me the return of Mr. Devin Kelly. Devin was my first ever guest on this podcast in episode three. So you can scroll back to episode three and have a listen to um, Devin there. I'm in the process of editing that episode because we did it over WhatsApp and he's based in China. So there's a little bit of times where the sound goes and we lose signal so i'm going to tidy up a little bit make it sound nice and pretty for your ears and um hopefully that's uh, it, it yeah you're if, it, if it's uploaded scroll across to episode 35 with Devin. message me get in touch it's wicked now people are sending me um voicemails so yeah so send me like a voicemail uh through my direct message in instagram if you've got any questions or feedback and then i can answer that live on air well not live but i can answer that on air and uh, it makes it a bit more interactive so feedback questions reviews please yes thank you Uh, see you next week have a good one